2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 and following. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today, be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. We have here the shortest passage of Scripture I think we've ever covered. And it's basically goodbye. <laughs> and so we should be out of here in three or four minutes, maybe. It's, uh, it's a conclusion to his letter. We, we haven't been in 2 Corinthians together, but it's a continuation of the same difficulties that have gone on. We've studied 1 Corinthians. We were there last week. And so uh, there's division, and that division continues, and he addresses it. And so he concludes this. It's an it's a exhortation. It's an encouragement. It's uh, a blessing. And when he offers it, he's bringing back to mind everything he's already said. Uh, finally, you know, preachers that say that in sermons sometimes lie. Paul's been, Paul's been known to lie occasionally when he'll say in conclusion and then just keep going. But now in this case, he, he, he's bringing it to an end. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Uh, and a different exhortation, a different conclusion. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Um, he wants us to take the long-term position here. If we look short-term, our problems are going to overwhelm us, especially the way the nation is today. I spent yesterday in just this horrible funk because of the condition of the nation and just, but Paul says rejoice, and that means that realize that God will win, that the kingdom will come, and that in God's ways, everything that is evil, everything that is wrong will be corrected. Uh, there will be justice in the end. There will be, in Christ, forgiveness for those who repent and receive it. Strive for full restoration. Some of your translations there will read differently than full restoration. Some translations will read perfection. Does anybody have a, a, a translation? Yeah, Terry's got one that says perfection. Um, perfection is just so full of preconceived notions that we need to back away from that. It's, it's not perfection as much as is uh, make complete, uh, even better would be make, it, make suitable for the task. And so what he's saying there is seek to be suitable for the task. Uh, uh, another translation may read, mend your ways. Um, it's bringing back to mind everything he has addressed as a way of correction He's saying rejoice, but at the same time, he's saying don't give up. One of the ways we can rejoice is to realize that God's not finished with us. If you, like me, consider your own faults and failings, uh, you may grow despondent, but rejoice because God's not finished, but you keep doing what you're able to do. You strive for full restoration, and then again, encourage one another. Uh, that speaks to the nature of the church. We're not a group of individuals. We're members of one body, Christ, but we're found in specific congregations. 
uh, if, if for no other reason than geography, we can't all get together worldwide. Uh, Kenzie was showing us a picture here a minute ago where, you know, the largest gathering of believers since Moses crossed the Red Sea. But that was only such a small token of Christians worldwide. So uh, we, we're in community, but we're to participate in community. And here he's saying encourage one another. It comes right after strive for, for full restoration or make yourself suitable for the task. So I have a responsibility to all y'all, and y'all have a responsibility to me. Keep going. You know, you can do better than this. Some of the most loving things in the last 38 years that I've been striving in the ministry from the time I felt the call and responded by going to seminary till this moment have been when other Christians in love have offered me not so much correction as direction on how to do better. Um, I had a man whose first name was Loyal so very appropriate, come to my house one time and ask me if I was spending enough time with my wife. Because <laughs> uh, he heard about all the places I was going and she was quadriplegic, my first wife. And I laughed and I said, brother, she always has the opportunity to go with me. And most of those people that you hear about the preacher came and saw, she was out in the van. She'd ride with me and we'd talk while riding and she'd get out and then when I was in visiting, she'd read or just look at the, you know, birds or whatever. But he, he loved me enough to ask that question, are you spending enough time at home? That, I believe, is encouragement. Because it was done A, in love, and it was done B, to, to help make sure, to ensure that I was living up to my sacred oath under God. Be of one mind. Uh, literally, that is, uh, think the same thing. Uh, as we heard in, in Philippians, let this mind be in you that also was in Christ Jesus. That was at verse 5. And so we have this idea of the way we encourage one another gives us the ability to be of one mind. Now, this one mind doesn't mean we lose our individual nature. It's not a hive mind, H-I-V-E, hive mind, where we're just all one mind, but we're thinking the same thoughts. And again, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you which as it was in Christ Jesus. That is, intentionally agree with God about what God thinks. That's true repentance. Intentionally think what God thinks. God says, this is a sin. It's a sin. I may not like it. When Jesus said, when somebody slaps you on one cheek, do what? Turn, turn the other cheek? I don't like that but I don't deny it, and I seek to let that be my mind. Don't have to like it. Live in peace. Now, he's given us a bunch of exhortations right here in this one verse, but let me tell you, the way we live in peace as a body of Christ is by thinking the same thing, being of one mind, and as we are of one mind, we can live in peace. The, the disunity in the church is because we're not thinking the same thing. Uh, we call ourselves Christians, but that so widely varies on where authority is and what's the definition of right and wrong. How about the country? Be of one mind. That would be a way of living in peace. He concludes that verse, and the God of love and peace will be with you. That's a blessing, but it's the condition that if we do these things, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage, be of one mind, live in peace, 
we meet that and the result is and the God of love and peace will be with you. Notice it's the God of love and peace, just one God. Then we're instructed, verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. That's not kissing on the mouth. Uh, it's like you see in the movies with uh, French people kissing on the side of the face. It can also be, depending on who's doing it and to whom is being receiving it, kissing a hand or even kissing a foot. If a young in the Lord uh, person shows great respect to an older Christian, it might even be kissing a foot. But the point is, it's an expression of love. It's an expression of unity, but it can also be a, an expression of submission. Submit yourselves one to another, we're told in Scripture. And so if, uh, I don't like it when it's kissing a papal ring, but I'm Protestant and I'm an American, and that just strikes me wrong, because the papal ring is a sign of authority and it's expected. To my mind, this should be something voluntary, not something required, but it is to build unity in the body of Christ, to show affection, love, unity. All God's people here send their greetings. Where are they? Well, they're in the province of Macedonia. We don't know the city, the specific location, but they're, they're somewhere in the province of Macedonia. And he's saying that, you know, all the believers, they're, they're thinking about you. They're sending their greetings. Verse 14, may the grace, the kelos, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love agape of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Fellowship there was fellowship, communion, mutual gathering, mutual harmony. And so that's the end of the text and we're done. <laughs> Why do we have this text? Sunday is Trinity Sunday. I made reference to this text last week when we were in 1 Corinthians and I was reading out a passage and I said, notice that the full Trinity is here. Let me just quote that passage. It's at 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. That's the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Lord there is Jesus. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God that is Father at work. And so you've got reverse order there, Spirit, Son, Father. Last week when I read this, I tried to point out, because I knew this week was coming, I tried to point out that's the Trinity at work. He doesn't call it the Trinity. Trinity doesn't show up in Scripture. But Paul has the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in, all of, in, in, in many places. Uh, briefly, he's got it, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, just read it. 2 Corinthians 1, 18 through 22, Galatians 4, 4 through 6, Romans 5, 1 through 11, Romans 8, 5 through 11, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. So you've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit showing up throughout Paul. You have it in the Gospels. Sunday's Gospel, Matthew 28. Go therefore in all the world and make disciples. Doing what? Teaching them to obey all things and baptizing them how? It, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now last week, Acts 2, for the sermon, it said baptize in the name of Jesus. Is that contradiction? That's one point where the church has to figure out what is God saying here. Because Acts 2, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter says, baptize in the name of Jesus. Now in Matthew 28, at the Great Commission, we're told, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Sir. That was during the time of when, when they were baptizing in the name of the rap, or you know, different people. John the Baptist. 
They were baptizing in his name. And, and in well, no, no, no. John baptized a baptism of repentance. He yeah. never said, I baptize you in the name of... of yeah. But followers of, would baptize in the name of yeah. John the Baptist. And here's, here's an important point. They were missing it. Yeah, here's an important point. Uh, in those days, if, if, if you were a teacher, mm -hmm. you made disciples for yourself. From the day of Jesus on, we didn't make disciples of ourselves. I don't make you a disciple of Earl. We make disciples of Jesus. But very specifically, it's baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Matthew 28. And you're thinking, well, which one's right? And the correct answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> if you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you are baptizing in the name of Jesus because Jesus is the middle one, the Son. It's not a matter of one being wrong. It's a matter of one of them giving you more information than does the other one. And there it lies in the problem. Nowhere in Scripture do you have just this systematic theology laid out easily where all of us can join in and say, that's it. If you, know, if you want to know why the church split, there's a church in the East Orthodox, a church in the West Protestant. That's the first major split in the church. It happened in the 11th century. It happened over their understanding of who God is. All the early heresies were addressing who is God, specifically who is God the Son. They split East and West, Orthodox and Catholic, over one phrase in the Latin, philequa, which means in the Son. Let me explain. We have from 325 A.D., the widest accepted affirmation of faith. We call it the Nicene Creed. In 381, it was amended and perfected, and that's what comes to us today. But in the 11th century, the Pope wanted to add one phrase, philoqua, in the name of the Son. When he was trying to describe the origin of the Holy Spirit, it had been who proceeds from the Father. He wanted to add this one phrase so it would be who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the church split. What's my point? The Bible doesn't give us one complete thought on the person of God. So what we've had to do is we've had to take all the passages that give us insight and information about God and we pull them out and look at them together. And without denying one, I did not deny baptism in the name of Jesus, Acts 2. I add it to Matthew 28 and say, how can both of these be true. And so for the first few centuries, the biggest struggle was understanding who is Jesus. And that's because the Greeks had this understanding of people whose father was a god and their mother was human. Like Hercules, there was a class, a category. They're called demigods, half god, half human. And so the Greeks wanted to look at Jesus as a demigod. The Jews had this understanding in their scripture of a Messiah, a Savior. But to this moment, the orthodox position in Judaism is the Messiah is a human, just like King David, used mightily of God, but nevertheless human. And we understand God is divine, or Jesus is divine. So, you know, the biggest focus had to be on Jesus. But as we understood, Jesus is fully God, 100%. And at the same time, fully human, 100%. Not half and half. One whole, one whole. 
at the same time as we understood that, then we realized we really need to understand the nature of God. You've got Paul over here giving free, frequent reference to Father, Son, and Spirit. And in this one passage, you've got it. It's not in the traditional way we know the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but it's nevertheless there. And so what do we do with it? Well, the church looked at these passages, prayed. One of the things they did is they came up with creeds. Um, the best definition of a creed, a friend of mine, uh, a, former mem a member of one of my former churches said, well, it's our pledge of allegiance. That's what a creed is. It's our version of the Pledge of Allegiance. And we say it every Sunday here in church. Uh, we use, because it's my preference, uh, the Apostles' Creed. It's the oldest. Strangely enough, though, it's not the most authoritative because it was never fully adopted by the entire church. The one that has the most authority is the Nicene Creed as was amended in 381. The entire church agreed on that one. And so let me read it to you. This is the one that's in the hymnal, page uh, 880. We believe in one God. Now notice it says we believe. Alternately, some will say I believe. I like it we because it's a collective statement. We're not in this by ourselves. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord. Again, the word Lord, I translate it most often as boss. Y'all have heard that. The oldest translation, most accurate understanding of the word Lord is owner, owner. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, and maybe the Son, we're not sure on that point, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Catholic, that means universal, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come, amen. Now, that has the most authority in the entire body of Christ worldwide for understanding who God is. And yet at the same time, I want to point out a few things. You're not looking at a text here, but you can follow it or you can look it up later in the, in the hymnal. The vast majority of the description deals with Jesus, the Father. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. And that's it of the Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, possibly the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. That's it. And this long passage in the middle deals with Jesus. But even that is not enough because let's hear this about Jesus. He came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. What's missing? In that description, what's missing? He became truly human and was crucified. Everything between the time he was fully human, Bethlehem, 
and was crucified is omitted. My point, you better have this as a guideline, the, the, the creed as a guideline of the things that you must understand when you read this. And you've got to have the Bible. You've got to have the four Gospels and, and all everything else uh, to understand the nature of Jesus. This, this is only addressing the things that were misunderstood at the time it was written. And, and it's just a sketch. And it skips over all of his life. No miracles. No healings. No deliverances. And importantly, no teaching. No playing with the kids. Let the little children come unto me. Don't hinder them. None of that. You don't hear Mary calling him for supper when he's a boy. Uh, you don't, none of it. So my point is, have the affirmation because that's the only way we can understand the nature of God. But it takes the, the affirmation, not replacing the scriptures, but, but guiding us. Because if you read one text, for example, let, let me give you one example. Philippians 2, 7 says that he emptied himself of everything that made him equal with God. One of my favorite passages, it's uh, in, the, in the Greek, it's uh, kenosis, emptied himself. He, uh, he did not consider equality with God something to grasp, to hold on to, but he emptied himself. Well, yeah, that's fine. Paul in Philippians 2 at 7, but Paul at Colossians 2 at 9, for in him, Jesus, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Well, Paul, which is it? <laughs> Make, up your mind. Make up your mind. Is he empty? Is he full? You know. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And see, that's the thing is that uh, we're finite humans trying to understand the infinite. Now, my buddy, Eddie Bromley, who uh, is associate pastor over at uh, Jackson First, he says, don't play the mystery card too quickly. Uh, temptation on Trinity Sunday is just say, well, it's a mystery. You can say what you can say. What we can say is what Scripture teaches us and what, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the church, universal, has given us as definitive guideline. And for me, that especially is the Nicene Creed as was amended in 381. But it's only scratching the surface. And so um, we can say what we can say. One of the ways the church has, uh, has defined, not defined, has taught the Trinity is, is through symbolism. I've got a few of my favorite symbols. I'll, I'll show the, the uh, camera first. You've got these elliptical representations, three of them, indicating Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But notice how they interplay, and they're actually one, but they're like three lobes. And then they've got this circle around them indicating unity. And that is my favorite one, if y'all want to look at it. And if not, I'll pass it down this way and let Terry get a good view of it, and you pass it on to Gail. A, a more artistic representation is uh, this one here because it's in color, and it's got uh, the Father at the top, it's got the Lamb as Jesus, and it's got the Spirit as a dove. But again, symbolism can be misunderstood. Um, the uh, the uh, glass, stained glass in the sanctuary at First Methodist Atlanta is famous worldwide for its beauty. And uh, when I got to Atlanta to start Emory University, the Candler School of Theology, I heard about this world famous stained glass imagery in the sanctuary. So one weekday, I went down there and they had the place open for you to go through and tour the stained glass. And I'm sitting there looking at the various pictures and this little boy comes in with his daddy. 
And they're looking at various pictures, and the Father was explaining this is a representation of God the Father and how that worked out. And he you know, went to the Lamb that was slain. This is a representation of Jesus and why. And they moved to the Holy Spirit. And the little kid speaks up and said, Dad, what's that chicken doing going down in flames? You know, <laughs> you know, even symbolism. And, and then you have some that is supposedly teaching symbolism. This is the one that's most frequent in the center. You've got this circle that says God, and you've got these uh, lines going out to the three outer circles, and the lines going out all say is. And so the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But then between the outer circles, you've got lines that say is not. So the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not God. Trouble with that is it doesn't give as strong a representation of the uh, interaction between the three persons of the Godhead. The one thing I know about Father, Son, Holy Spirit is their number one attribute, love, is expressed in relationship. And by that, before the creation, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit interacted with one another. Now, we say that the Son and the Holy Spirit are begotten, uh, born of, and yet we're told simultaneously there never was a time that the Son and the Spirit were not. I don't explain it, I just pass it on. But at some point, before creation, you've got the Father, the Son, the Spirit relating to one another, loving one another. Now my favorite imagery of this comes from the Orthodox Church where uh, uh, their phrasing for the Trinity translates as a circle dance. Circle dance. Think of my big fat Greek wedding. Did y'all see that? Mm -hmm bunch of people in a circle with their arms around each other and, and they're dancing la da 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 and this imagery is how the orthodox church talks about how the father the son the spirit are constantly in a relationship with one another now we in the West pick that imagery up and we've got the hymn, The Lord of the Dance. And life is viewed as a dance. But that's stressing the relationship between one another. You've got one God, you've got three persons. All right, that's the easy part. The, this next part gave me a headache in getting it down and because it's so complicated, I intend to read it. This is a technical definition of God. God is one God, but three co-eternal, consubstantial persuses, persons, or hypostases, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God in three divine persons. The persons are distinct yet are one substance, essence, or nature. In this context, nature is what one is. Person is who one is. Nature is what? Person who. And so you've got three persons, the who, one nature, the what. And so we've got reflection by early Christians on passages such as the Great Commission, Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Paul's apostolic blessing that we hear today. While at the same time we hold that intention with probably what is the most authoritative prayer in the Old Testament. In Hebrew scripture, you've got this prayer that every 
observant Jew prays multiple times a day. It's called the Shema from the beginning in Hebrew, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. The Lord alone is better than the translation, the Lord is one. For years, I had been in to English as, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But it's the Lord alone. When Moses asked God, what's your name? God was sending him back to Egypt. You know, when, they, when I go back to Egypt, Lord, they're going to want to know what your name is. They've got gods all over the place, and they've all got names. What's your name, O oh God? And uh, God said, well, when you go back, tell them my name is, what's the name? Anybody? I am. I am. I am. In the Hebrew, Yahweh. What's he saying there? He's saying, I'm the only one up here. I'm the only God. I am God alone. There's none beside me. And so you've got this imagery from Hebrew scripture of God alone. And yet we Christians look at Hebrew scripture and we say the Trinity's all over the place. Starts in verse 1, chapter 1 of Genesis. In the beginning, God. But the funny thing there is, in Hebrew, that's in plural. Created is singular. You've got the first verse in Scripture. Having grammatical incorrection based on number. God's created three in one plural singular yes three persons one substance um, you've got appearances of Jesus Joshua son of Nun facing Jericho sees this warrior as he approaches Jericho and he asks the most pertinent question possible. He says, are you for us? Are you for our enemy? And the response is, no, but as the captain of the Lord of hosts, I have now come. And he tells him something that's very specific. He says, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. Angels do not command worship unless they belong to the devil. Angels that belong to God always tell you, don't worship me, worship God. This captain of the army of hosts has commanded worship. And yet he's the captain of the army of hosts. It sounds like he's an angel. That has to be Jesus. And what he's saying there is, I'm not for you, I'm not for them. But as God, I'm here. I'm not for you, I'm not for them. But obey me. Worship me. And he tells him that, you know, march around the city seven times on the seventh day, blow your horn, march seven times, blow your horn, and everybody will go straight in. And, so you've got Jesus showing up. You've got in uh, Genesis the three that appear before uh, Abraham. Genesis 18, 19. Abraham visited by three men, 18, 1 through 2. In 19, you've got two angels visiting Lot at Sodom. And so you've got, uh, you've got people showing up that historically in the church, people are saying, that's not an angel. <laughs> Maybe divine, but it ain't an angel. My point is it takes all of Scripture to understand what can be understood. And even then, I'm going to play the mystery card and say we're only going to be able to understand as far as Scripture takes us 
with the wisdom that the church has been able to gather for 2,000 years under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And even that's going to be partial, not wrong, partial. That's why we have to keep reading it. <laughs> Amen. Keep praying, keep pressing in. But you know, that's the point where I'm going to finish it today, Jeanette. God is a God that would be sought by us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on his name while he is near. God wants us to chase him. He chased us to get us saved. Now we chase God, and that's the beauty. And so having said that, I'm going to cut this to a stop.